Howdy folks, in this video we are going to discuss some numerical methods for computing eigenvalues. To accomplish this, we will explore these methods and demonstrate them with some code written in Python. You can find all that code along with some additional written notes and a list of references at the GitHub link in the description, all in the form of a Jupyter Notebook for your convenience. Lastly, if you find this discussion useful, helpful, informative, or even entertaining, consider interacting with it in some way, as that will make it much easier for other individuals to find this discussion. Without further ado, though, let's begin discussing some numerical methods for computing eigenvalues. So let me quickly preface that uh, I'm assuming that you're familiar with both eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I'm not going to explain to you what eigenvalues or eigenvectors are, so if you're unfamiliar with what these concepts are, uh, then this video is not necessarily for you. We're going to focus particularly on some numerical methods for computing eigenvalues, as numerical methods for computing eigenvalues are going to differ significantly from how we might approach that analytically. If this uh, determinant equation right here looks familiar to you, well, this might be familiar with how you may have been uh, taught how to compute eigenvalues analytically on a whiteboard, for example, uh, for very small matrices, but uh, it is grossly inefficient, and it's realistically not going to work, and so if we're going to, if I'm going to show you this, I'm going to definitely cross it out, because uh, it's crap. You should not, uh, you, should, you should just forget this when we're thinking about computing eigenvalues numerically. And this is also where I will forewarn you that numerical methods for computing eigenvalues very much get into the weeds of concepts of linear algebra and uh, just, just concepts in numerical uh, mathematics or, or, or discrete mathematics, really. And so I'll refer you to a bunch of the different uh, linear algebra videos that I've done previously as reference material for this, particularly the QR matrix decomposition video and then the ones preceding that. But there are three pieces of information that I have not discussed yet here on the internet, and so I'll ask you to please indulge me as we uh, go through uh, these three crucial pieces of prerequisite information before uh, getting into the actual numerical methods for computing eigenvalues. The first prerequisite concept that we need to understand is matrix similarity. Now, matrix similarity means something very specific. Okay, if we consider so, if we consider two different matrices A and B, for simplicity throughout this video, we're just going to assume they're square, even though I put M by N on here. But but like, consider we have two matrices A and B. Uh, we can only say that these two matrices A and B are similar if an invertible X matrix exists such that this relationship between matrix A and matrix B holds. So if we have matrix A and we compute the matrix product of uh, X inverse by B by X, that's why X needs to be invertible, and we get back our A matrix, then A and B are similar. We can flip A and B around. We could also uh, similarly compute uh, X by B by X inverse. Matrices are only similar if this relationship holds. If matrix A and matrix B are of the same shape, that's not enough to say that they're similar. If they both all have real values, or both all have complex values, they're not similar. If they're both upper triangular, if they're both lower triangular, if they're both uh, diagonal matrices, that does not necessarily mean that the matrices are similar. This relationship has to hold. And that's particularly important because if A and B are similar matrices, they will share a number of the same uh, values or qualities. So, so they will share the same rank, they will share the same determinant, they will share the same trace. There are numerous of uh, the, these qualities that they will share, but most importantly, they will share the same eigenvalues. And this idea of matrix similarity and the fact that the similar matrices will share the same eigenvalues is a crucial piece of information that we can leverage to our advantage in computing eigenvalues. Okay, so the second crucial bit of prerequisite information that we're going to uh, need to understand with uh, some of these numerical methods for computing eigenvalues is the sure decomposition. And it's not so much the sure decomposition itself that we need to understand, but rather uh, a little bit of information that we get from a derivation of the sure decomposition that's going to be helpful to us. And so uh, 
before getting into the sure decomposition, uh, let me quickly go over some decompositions for you. We uh, the, One of the first matrix decompositions that uh, I hope you're all familiar with is the Lu decomposition, and with that we saw that we could decompose it further into LDV. These are the first like two kind of discussions that I've done on uh, matrix decompositions. Then for positive definite matrices, uh, there's the Cholesky matrix decomposition, which has its own bit of advantages, and we could decompose that further into LDL transpose. But most recently, uh, in these linear algebra discussions, we discussed the QR matrix decomposition. And uh, let me just have you guess quickly uh, what the Schur matrix decomposition is going to be. Well, it's going to be a three matrix uh, or uh, a further decomposition of QR into three matrices. And so that's just what I kind of want to motivate this all by. Um, and so we'll start off with this kind of derivation that's going to be useful to us by just assuming we have some square A matrix that we can compute a QR matrix decomposition for. I'll remind you that the benefit of the QR matrix decomposition is the orthonormal matrix Q because of this particular identity right here, which is that when we compute Q by Q transpose, or Q transpose by Q, we get back the identity matrix, implying to us that Q transpose is really Q inverse, which is very, very useful, especially numerically, because we don't actually have to compute an inverse. I specifically have not done any discussions on computing matrix inverses as it's very much more in the weeds in my opinion than computing eigenvalues and uh, therefore computing inverses really ought to be avoided whenever possible and so if we can use an orthonormal matrix and just you know transpose it and then get the inverse that's extremely beneficial to us so let's set that all aside uh, and um, you know highlight that important bit of information. But uh, again, setting that aside, what we're going to do now is we're just going to uh, suppose that we compute some new matrix B with uh, RQ, which we got from our QR decomposition of, of A. So we're just going to you know flip those around, compute B, and now this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting. We're going to left multiply both sides here by our identity matrix. On the left-hand side, that really doesn't do anything. It doesn't really matter. We can just, you know, say that's still our B matrix. And so now we have B is equal to the identity matrix by R by Q. But remember our identity here from before for uh, orthonormal matrices. Uh, the I is Q by Q transpose or Q transpose by Q. Let's substitute Q transpose by Q right in there. And what you'll notice right here is that we have Q transpose by Q by R by Q. And uh, that's really just Q inverse by Q by R by Q. And if you'll notice, we have this QR right in the middle of these four matrices, and the product of that is our A matrix. And so we can just substitute that in right there. And if we look at this very, very closely, this that B is equal to Q inverse by A by Q, this is actually telling us that our Q matrix satisfies our requirement of an invertible X matrix such that this is proving to us that A and B are similar matrices. If we put them side by side and look at one another from what we had before, it's very clear that our Q matrix in this case is that invertible X matrix such that B and A or A and B are similar matrices and therefore they will share a number of the same qualities. Most importantly though, they will share the same eigenvalues and that's going to be very useful for us. And so if we go back here and you know right to everything that we've done and we go all the way back up to the top of this kind of derivation that we've done, one such way that we can compute a similar matrix for uh, some given A matrix is we can just compute a QR matrix decomposition flip the Q and the R around, compute the product RQ, set that equal to, uh, you know, some new matrix variable, and that new matrix variable, in this case B, will be our similar matrix to A. Okay, but uh, don't just take my word for it. Let's test this out uh, for ourselves. Let's use this knowledge that we've got from of similar matrices and uh, the, what we got through this derivation of the sure decomposition uh, to uh, investigate and, and show uh, that... Uh, matrix A and matrix B, or two similar matrices will share the same eigenvalue. So here you can see this block of code. Again, you can find it all at the GitHub link in the description of this video. We are going to generate a random 3x3A three three matrix with values between 0 and 100. We're going to use the numpy linalg eig function to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for that 
a matrix. Then what we're going to do is we are going to compute a QR matrix decomposition of that original uh, randomly generated A matrix. And then we'll compute a similar matrix with uh, our R and Q matrices computing the product uh, RQ. And then we will use the same NumPy Linalge eig function on that similar matrix to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Although this is a broader discussion on numerical methods for computing eigenvalues in a conventional world, you're going to, at least in Python, you're going to be using the NumPy Linalge eig function to compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You're not necessarily going to be using the methods that we will discuss uh, later on in, in, you know, in this discussion. That's not the, the motivation of this discussion. The motivation of this discussion is to understand these numerical methods and uh, just understand how they work and, and explore them. So let me go ahead and run this code. This is what the terminal output uh, will kind of look like. Here you can see at the top we have our A matrix, all different values. You can see it's clearly not uh, symmetric in any way, all you know, random values 3 by 3. Uh, our eigenvalues for our A matrix are 159 and some change, negative 29 and some change, and 35 and some change. Now, our similar matrix B, which is the product RQ, you can see is very clearly different from our A matrix. But when we compute the eigenvalues for this B matrix, you can see they are exactly the same. And again, I'll refer you back to this code. Um, we're not doing anything crazy or different here. Two very different uh, matrices, but they are similar matrices, and so they do share the same eigenvalue. Now, the last little bit of prerequisite information that's going to be very useful to our understanding of uh, some of these numerical methods for computing eigenvalues is something known as the Rayleigh Quotient. Now, I will forewarn you that we're not going to focus heavily on the Rayleigh Quotient. You can definitely get very in the weeds of the Rayleigh Quotient. And so I'll recommend a very, very good video uh, through the math department at Harvard. I think it's through the math department at Harvard, at least, um, that goes much more in-depth at doing derivations and things like that for the Rayleigh Quotient, explaining a little bit uh, with it. Um, but anyways, this is the Rayleigh Quotient. Okay, you can pick whichever form of notation that you like. I will remind everybody that my background is in physics, and so that for complex conjugates, uh, I use the star notation, not the bar notation, because I also really like using the uh, uh, the little vector arrows on the top. So mathematicians, don't get mad at me about this. I <laughs> I don't really care. I like I like my notation better. I like the physicist's notation better. But um, so this is this is the Rayleigh quotient. You can pick whichever notation that you like. Um, but uh, this this is what it's more or less defined as, and what you will see is m most people will talk about this Rayleigh quotient being used for a Hermitian matrix A or a, a symmetric matrix A, but realistically, um, if you go deeper into the weeds of this, you will find, and, and later in this video you will also see, that this Rayleigh quotient will work perfectly fine with uh, non-symmetric or non-Hermitian matrices for those of you doing, dealing with complex stuff. But the whole reason why this Rayleigh quotient is important is that it, you know it's going to accept some x vector in our A matrix. If we pass in an eigenvector v into this Rayleigh quotient, it will produce uh, the corresponding eigenvalue to then give us the eigenpair. And this is a, a really crucial uh, bit of information. Now, the Rayleigh quotient is much more important than just a way for us to produce an eigenvalue from an eigenvector. We'll see that with some of these methods. If you want, if you want to get into the weeds of what the Rayleigh quotient is, um, more specifically, I'll refer you over to that video because it's 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 way more in depth than I could ever go on the Rayleigh quotient, and it's also way more in depth than I'm also willing to go on the Rayleigh quotient. So I'll refer you over there if you want to get into the weeds of that. But for the purposes of this video, just know that the Rayleigh quotient it's this very uh, useful formula right here that will give us this scalar quantity uh, known as the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, and if we happen to throw an eigenvector into it, we will get out an eigenvalue. And so to demonstrate this uh, and explore this, uh, we will go ahead and uh, we will use this bit of code right here. Um, you can see uh, we've defined a function called R quotient. It's going to accept some vector. It's going to accept an A matrix. And it's just going to compute the uh, Rayleigh quotient for us. Now I will remind everybody that for the sake of simplicity, uh, I am working only with real values here, and the A matrix that we're using is the same A matrix that we used uh, in showing that similar matrices uh, do share the same eigenvalues. Then what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, iterate through all of our eigenvectors from our A matrix here. 
and compute the Rayleigh quotient to show that uh, those uh, eigenvectors uh, do uh, produce an eigenvalue. And so if we run this code, uh, you can see, uh, let me just remind everybody of our A matrix up at the top, the eigenvalues using the numpy linalge eig function are up next, 159 and some change, negative 29.802 and some change, and 35.59 and some change. The eigenvectors for A, again computed with the numpy linalge eig function are the columns of this matrix that we're seeing right here. So each one of these are our eigenvectors. And when we put each one of those columns into the Rayleigh quotient function, which let me uh, briefly remind you that uh, if we're going to iterate over this matrix, we need to transpose it so those rows become columns. Then we uh, will just, you know, for the with this for loop, it'll iterate over the rows. But when we do that, you can see that uh, we get back each of the eigenvalues. And again, the Rayleigh quotient is much more than just a way for us to c compute an eigenvalue with an eigenvector. I guess this is kind of like a baby numerical method, if you will, for uh, computing eigenvalues by numerical means. But it's, it, it's not intended to be that way because as you will see uh, as we get into some of these methods, the Rayleigh quotient is much more than just a way of producing an eigenvalue. Okay, so all the prerequisite stuff now out of the way, let me introduce you to uh, the first numerical method uh, that I want to take a look at for computing eigenvalues, which is the QR algorithm, of course, leveraging our knowledge of the QR matrix decomposition. Again, I will leave a reference link in the description if you want to uh, know a little bit more about the QR matrix decomposition and how we can compute it uh, with some of those numerical methods. But anyways, we're just going to assume that we have some initial A matrix called A0, and we're going to decompose it with the R QR matrix decomposition. Then using Q0 and R0, we will compute a similar matrix, A1, using uh, R0 and Q0. Again, uh, this is kind of building off of uh, the matrix similarity that we discussed, along with uh, the, uh, that little bit of information from the sure decomposition on how we can actually compute a similar matrix. Then what we're going to do is we're just going to compute another QR matrix decomposition, this time, though, of the first similar matrix, A1, which will give us Q1 and R1, and we can use those to compute A2. And hopefully you can see uh, where I'm going with this and what we're going to do, because uh, as you'll be able to see right here, A0, A1, A2, and as many of these similar matrices as we compute will all have the same eigenvalues, and that's really important. And so uh, very clearly, hopefully you can see that this can be generalized uh, so that we're going to, uh, you know, compute a QR matrix decomposition with this procedure. And then we're just going to compute a, a similar matrix uh, using, you know, RN and QN, and that will give us, you know, AN plus 1. And so the general idea here is going to be to use this general procedure here to keep on computing more and more and more iterations of similar matrices until we reach some an uh, similar matrix and being the number of iterations here where we will have something that's like upper triangular in nature uh, ideally we have all zeros below the diagonal but that's not really going to happen because again we're, de we're dealing with stuff that's uh, numerical in nature so we'll just have very small values or small epsilons below our diagonal but the important bit of this is that all of the eigenvalues uh will uh be along the diagonal. So as we compute more and more of these similar matrices, uh, it, each iteration of the next similar matrix will converge closer uh, to the actual value of the eigenvalues along the diagonal. And on the point of there being like small epsilons or, or things that are not perfectly zero below the diagonal, when we're dealing with numerical mathematics, you never really are going to compute the eigenvalues perfectly, okay? Instead, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to establish some sort of threshold to the degree of precision we want to compute these eigenvalues to. And so with some code, uh, we're going to make use of this make similar function that I've created here a lot. We're just going to use the numpy linalge qr function, uh, you know, to compute uh, a qr matrix decomposition for some given a matrix, and then we're just going to compute the matrix product rq, and then return uh, that similar matrix. 
Then to actually demonstrate this method, we're going to use this IGQR function. You can see the first thing that we're doing is we're computing a similar matrix for our, our original A matrix. We're keeping track of our total number of iterations. This L IG value we're setting to be uh, the last eigenvalue along our diagonal of each similar matrix. This is just going to be the first similar matrix up here. Um, but later on in the while loop, you can see that we're resetting that to uh, the last value of every single similar matrix. And that's going to be very important uh, when computing the difference. And so this diff variable here is just going to be, uh, you know, to keep track of the differences between one, the last eigenvalue from one iteration uh, to the next. And so we're going to keep on generating more and more similar matrices until the difference between that last eigenvalue from one iteration to the next is uh, less than an order of 1 times 10 to the minus 32, or an order of 10 to the minus 32, simply because that's the level of precision that I've just chosen here. Again, when it comes to doing any type of numerical mathematics, you're going to need to establish for yourself what degree of precision or to what degree of error you're comfortable with. In this example, I'm comfortable with things on order of 10 to the minus 32 uh, precision. That might not be enough for you. That might be overkill for you. Um, because we're never going to get anything perfectly, it's going to be up to you to figure out uh, what those constraints are. And so in this while loop, we're very much so just doing the same thing. We're computing a similar matrix uh, based off of matrix uh, B. We're bumping our iterations by one, so we're just going to count out all our iterations so we can compare all these methods to one another. Um, then we're computing a difference between that last eigenvalue versus uh, the eigenvalue in this uh, most recent uh, iteration. And then we're going to reset that uh, last eigenvalue so that we can compute the difference next time. And so we can constantly just keep up with the difference between uh, one iteration to the next. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're just going to strip all the values off of our diagonal. That's going to be our eigenvalues. And we're going to return our eigenvalues and the total number of iterations. You can see then uh, all the rest of this is just set up for what we're going to see in the terminal. And so this is what we end up getting. You can see after 192 iterations, this is uh, the 192nd similar matrix. Very small values, as you, they're, they're, as you can see, there are very small values along, uh, below the diagonal here. But if we go down to our eigenvalues, you can see that uh, they're uh, very precise. Uh, it doesn't actually show that they're on order of 10 to the minus 32 precision. But after 192 iterations, they are there. And these are, of course, for that original A matrix, which going back to uh, just using the NumPy Linalge eig function produced and the QR algorithm that uh, we've created here and uh, just ran is, is producing that as well. But 192 iterations is quite a bit computationally intensive. And so there's actually a way for us to speed up the QR algorithm. And that will be the next method that uh, we discuss. And so the second numerical method that I will introduce you to is the QR algorithm with shifts, which, as you might expect, is really just the QR algorithm with uh, something known as a shift. And so to start things off, we can start off in two ways. The first thing that we can do is we can start off our QR algorithm with shifts by just doing the first step of the QR algorithm, which is computing a QR matrix decomposition for our A matrix, uh, A0 in this case, and then computing a similar matrix, A1, using R0 and Q0. Or we can introduce this idea of a shift right from the beginning. So we can take A0 and subtract off uh, some scalar value uh, S by our identity matrix, which is just going to shift the values of our diagonal, because that's ideally where our uh, eigenvalues are going to be. Remember, this is what we're expecting after doing a number of iterations with just the normal QR algorithm is these uh, zeros below the diagonal or something close to zero below the diagonal, and most importantly, our eigenvalues along the diagonal of uh, whatever nth similar matrix we end up computing. Okay, and uh, so we'll do a QR matrix decomposition of that shifted uh, matrix, and then what we'll do is we'll compute a similar matrix using R0 and Q0, and then re-adding in that shift. Then just uh, more so in general, we will go through, and for each subsequent iteration after zero, so you can start off doing the shifting from the beginning, or you can do it after uh, the uh, first, uh, after computing the first similar matrix. 
but then in general after this point we will do this shifting every single time to compute each subsequent uh, similar matrix so we'll just you know take an uh, subtract off the identity matrix times some scalar shift compute a QR matrix decomposition of that shifted matrix and then we will compute a similar matrix uh, using R and N and QN and then re-add in that shift. And the idea here is that this is going to speed everything up. I know this might be a little bit confusing, um, but the, the, the whole reason why we're doing the, these shifts is because it's going to speed things up. And so really, where does this shift come from? How do we choose a shift? I've kind of just thrown this shift at all of you um, who are listening, and you might not know how to choose a shift, where the shift comes from, why the shifting... Uh, is uh, going to improve anything at all. And so uh, let's discuss this shift a little bit. Okay, so how do we go about actually choosing a shift that's going to speed things up? Well, first we want to choose a new shift with each iteration. So each shift is going to be uh, special, I guess, uh, to each subsequent similar matrix that we compute. Secondly, uh, we're going to want to choose a shift that is close to uh, the value of an eigenvalue for our uh, original A matrix. And that might seem kind of stupid. And to me, that also seems kind of stupid. How am I supposed to choose a value or choose a shift that's close to the value of one of our eigenvalues? Isn't the whole point of this to, to compute our eigenvalues? As it turns out, we have a really useful tool to help us you know, make a good educated guess at what one of our eigenvalues is going to be. We can take a look at the end result of what we expect here with this AN matrix where we're going to have our eigenvalues converge uh, on the diagonal of the matrix. And so you might think, why don't we just choose one of the values along our diagonal to be our shift. And that's actually not a bad thought because in theory, with each new uh, iteration uh, of this these AN matrices that we compute, our values along the diagonal should be better and better uh, or, or closer and closer to actual you know eigenvalues. But that's not necessarily the best way of going. You could do that method, but it's not the best way of going. The other thing to think about is that this is, a, in, in theory, should be an upper triangular matrix. And so the last column of this uh, matrix is going to be the only complete column, meaning that there aren't you know zeros below the diagonal. And so in theory, this should actually converge to being something like an eigenvector. So we could use our Rayleigh quotient to predict the eigenvalue for this corresponding eigen vector. But we don't even really need to do that because down here along our diagonal we're going to have uh, the corresponding eigenvalue to that eigenvector in theory. And so in a perfect world if that last column converges to being an eigenvector then the Rayleigh quotient is just this last value. So here is the entire uh, QR algorithm with shifts for computing eigenvalues. You can see we're defining this eigQR shifts that's accepting an A matrix. You can see we have a couple of different quargs here. So we have a reference eigenvalue that's going to be the reference index for our eigenvalue for computing uh, you know, precision and things like that. Then we're going to choose a shift index and this is going to allow us to choose different values for our shift. We'll, we'll explore that one uh, later on, not necessarily in this example, but we'll use that later. And then we also have verbose so that you can, you know, if you want to rerun this code for yourself, uh, it'll just print out each similar matrix as things get computed. Things are starting out no different than the QR algorithm. We're going to compute a initial similar matrix. You can see I'm opting for, I'm opting for this uh, first or, 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 or top method where we're not doing any shifts from the beginning. So we're just going to compute an initial similar matrix and then introduce the shifts for each subsequent computation of a similar matrix, so everything greater than n equals 1. Uh, n is going to be the number of iterations here. Uh, L eig is just going to be um, what we're using as our reference in this case. So just like with the QR algorithm, between one iteration to the next, we are going to compare uh, the values along the diagonal of each similar matrix to see what level of precision we have with them. That level of precision is going to help us out with uh, the difference. So the difference is, uh, at the beginning is just a placeholder. And so uh, while our difference is uh, less precise than on order of 10 to the minus 32, 
or we've done less than uh, 100 iterations. We're going to keep going through and computing more and more similar matrices. And the reason why I put that, uh, that other constraint on there to stop after 100 uh, similar matrices is that the whole idea of this is that we're you know supposed to speed things up, and, and it actually does. You'll see that in a moment. But anyways, uh, we define our shift as the identity matrix by whatever uh, value along the diagonal we choose to be our shift. Because again, in theory, um, the whole idea is that we want to choose something close to an eigenvalue. So I, I, I kind of want to compare all the different uh, values along the diagonal here and choosing that as our shift to see what kind of better results that we end up getting. And so that, you know, that's just going to be based off of our index. In this case, uh, it's just going to be the last uh, value along our diagonal is going to be our shift because that's going to be our uh, Rayleigh quotient. Then we're going to actually do the shift. We're going to compute a similar matrix and then reintroduce that shift, bump our iterations by one, compute the difference between the last eigenvalue of our previous iteration with this current iteration, and then we're going to reset uh, that 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 value. And so in this case, using the, the you know the built-in defaults for the quarks, it's going to be the last uh, position along our diagonal. Then we're just going to strip all the values off of the diagonal of the last similar matrix we compute, return those eigenvalues, and the total number of iterations. Then here's all the motivating code that uh, we're going to run right here, and we're going to actually compute these eigenvalues three different times using different reference eigenvalues here. So we're going to our shift is going to be the last value along our diagonal, but I just want to show you that the total number of iterations for us to reach uh, 10 to minus 32 precision is going to be different depending on which value uh, along our diagonal we use as our reference uh, for each one of the different iterations that we have right here. So just to remind everybody, uh, this is our original A matrix. It's the same A matrix that we've used with the uh, QR algorithm with showing that similar matrices have um, the same eigenvalues and with the Rayleigh quotient and all that. And you can see that uh, this time it takes us 34 similar matrices or 34 iterations for us to get uh, to uh, precision on order of 10 to the minus 32. You can see we have something that's close uh, to uh, you know, perfect zeros below the diagonal, and not quite again because we're doing this, you know, this numerically. But when we strip those eigenvalues off the diagonal, we get 159 and some change, 35.59 and some change, and minus 29.8 and some change after 34 iterations. If we do this though using the uh, second value along the diagonal, um, you can see it also takes 34 iterations, and we get um, you know the same eigenvalues as before, and so 34 iterations. Uh, compared to 190 some using QR without shifts is much much faster, but this is where things get really uh, important. Lastly, you can see that that uh, using that last value as our reference, you can see that that last eigenvalue along the diagonal actually converges the fastest, reaching precision on order of 10 to the minus 32 after just five iterations. So, logical question you might ask is what happens if we are changing our shift to be those different values along the diagonal. And so what this code is going to do is we're going to iterate over uh, the, the indexes for our shifts and uh, the reference eigenvalue for computing the differences from back here uh, to, to you know where this is all going to stop on order of 10 to the minus 32. And I'm going to show you through producing a, uh, a bit of a heat map that uh, that last value uh, along the diagonal is actually the best because it is a really quotient of that last column. And so here's a diagram of what that's going to produce. And let me briefly explain what this shows us. On the top, uh, we have our shift index. So uh, the, you know, the, the, the first value along our diagonal, the second value along the diagonal, the third value along our diagonal, that's going to be our shift. On the left here on the y-axis, we have uh, the reference eigenvalue for what we're going to be using to compute those different levels of precision. So uh, 0, 1, and 2 on that case, all just referencing the position of our uh, eigenvalues. And so, so this hopefully makes more sense for you. Um, you know, uh, we're going to be choosing uh, each one of these values along our diagonal to be our reference point in computing the difference from one iteration to the next. And that's what I mean by the... Uh, reference eigenvalue. Now, what you can see with this heat map is uh, the total number of iterations. And so you can see that the, the darker it is, the l less iterations there are, and um, the brighter it is, the more iterations there are. And that's why I'm having things stop after 100 iterations. 
because this could just keep going for a while. You can see with the exception of choosing the first value along a diagonal as the shift, and our reference being the last value along the diagonal, you can see that kind of works all right. But it's not even a question at this point. The best value to choose as our shift that's going to make things converge the fastest is the last eigenvalue along the diagonal. That's this last uh, column that you can see right here. And it's obviously going to converge the fastest, like we saw uh, in the, with the terminal, um, when for that last value along the diagonal as well, when we use that as our reference. Okay, but uh, we can rerun this with a completely different matrix with completely different eigenvalues. You can see uh, we have something sort of similar going on, although it, we still see the same thing. Choosing that last value along the diagonal to be our shift is the fastest converging, no matter which reference we use. Here, even in this last or third case, uh, you can see that it by far beats using the other two values along the diagonal as the shift. So, so using this last value along the diagonal uh, as our shift is going to make things substantially faster. Now, deciding on which uh, value along the diagonal you want to reference is going to be entirely up to you. For this function, there's probably a better way of computing like maybe like an average difference. Um, so that you can incorporate all the eigenvalues, but the the focus of this function is not to is not to create like a, like a real uh, working function for computing uh, eigenvalues with uh, the QR algorithm with shifts. It's to explore the QR algorithm with shifts, and that's why we stop it at 100 iterations, and why we're exploring things using the uh, using one index at a time, and also in these heat maps with uh, choosing one different shift at a time as well. But I kind of just pulled uh, the shift out of thin air, and I don't really like that. And in reality, the QR algorithm with shifts is a very, very good method, uh, and, and kind of a tricky method as well. It's kind of in the weeds for computing eigenvalues. And so let me uh, just briefly say that there are other methods for computing eigenvalues that in some cases, and in a lot of cases, are, are better methods. But then there are also some worse, or in my opinion, older or, or, or not as good methods for computing eigenvalues. And if we go back to some of those, that might explain where uh, these shifts come from. So let me uh, now introduce you to two other new methods for computing eigenvalues that I think are a little bit inferior to QR or uh, the QR algorithm with shifts to kind of show you where these shifts come from. And to start that off, we're going to discuss a very popular method known as the power method. In some cases, it is uh, also described as the von Mises uh, iteration algorithm, but a lot of people just know it as power method. I'm assuming that it is the oldest method or one of the one of the older methods for computing eigenvalues. Uh, and so because of that, it's not really the greatest, but let me just introduce to you anyways, it's going to kind of motivate where these shifts come from. Okay, so the power method is uh, kind of just using this formula right here where we're going to use our A matrix and then just some X vector. Uh, it could be a random vector uh, for all we care, really. We're just going to compute AX. Uh, then normalize it, um, and then we are going to uh, that, that's, that's going to produce a new vector for us. Which is, and the idea with this is that after computing a certain number of iterations of these x vectors, uh, that x vector or you know whatever iteration of that x vector will uh, be something really really close to uh, an eigenvector. Then we can just very conveniently use our Rayleigh quotient which will give us the corresponding eigenvalue and the eigenpair. The problem with this, of course, is that it's only producing one eigenvalue for us and one eigenvector. So let's explore how this works in some code. Uh, we've defined power method here. We're generating a random vector to be our, our x vector. In this case, we're keeping track of the maximum eigenvalue, the difference, the total number of iterations and everything else like that from before. Um, the difference from one iteration to the next we're keeping track of, and we're going to stop this after precision on order of 10 to the minus 8. Again, I remind you that in numerical mathematics, we have to define uh, you know, what kind of error we want to be working with or what level of precision we want to be working with. In this case, 10 to the minus 8 is okay for me. And then we're just doing exactly what was there from before. So we're computing AX. Uh, then we're normalizing uh, you know, that, that, that AX value. We're dividing AX by that normalized uh, AX, and then we're using the Rayleigh quotient to get uh, the 
eigenvalue. We're computing the difference, resetting things, bumping the iterations, and then you know once this reaches a precision with that that eigenvalue on order of ten to the minus eight, we will uh, spit back out that eigenvalue, the eigenvector, and the total number of iterations. Here's the code that uh, we're going to use to do this. Uh, yes, I am calling the same function three times. I probably shouldn't have uh, done that, but whatever. Also, there's a typo in here where I reset where I set the uh, eigenvector to the same uh, total number of iterations. So we're not going to see the eigenvector. I will show you a corrected uh, version of this. But anyways, when we run this code, this is what we'll end up seeing. So just to remind everybody what our eigenvalues are for our A matrix uh, that we've used throughout this whole video, that's what they look like. Uh, there's, then there's also the eigenvectors for that uh, A matrix. Again, those were obtained with the NumPy Linalge eig function. And uh, this is the eigenvalue that we get after 16 iterations. The corresponding eigenvector is, of course, wrong. If you want that corresponding eigenvector, you can see that we do get that corresponding eigenvector. Uh, the values of that eigenvector uh, are different. You can see it's that first eigenvector in that first column. But uh, this is for a different matrix than uh, what we used from the beginning. Just because uh, every time I were to change this, uh, you know, it's going to generate a new uh, random uh, A matrix that we're going to start off to begin with. But that takes 15 iterations. But again, the problem with this method is it only produces one eigenvalue. How do we get the other eigenvalues, which is kind of a problem? We'll introduce the uh, inverse and Rayleigh iteration algorithm. We'll start off with the inverse iteration algorithm because Rayleigh is just kind of like adding a step to the inverse iteration. And so we're effectively going to do the same thing that we did with power method, but instead of just using the A matrix, we're going to use the inverse of our A matrix minus uh, some shift. So it's going to be it's going to be the shift. Uh, or you know the shift quantity times the identity matrix. So it's going to be shifting all the values along a diagonal. And so here, uh, by introducing this shift into this uh, formula right here, we're going to still go through the same process of producing more and more. And ideally, the, the, we're going to have the same idea of power method here, and that eventually, after computing a certain number of iterations of, of x vectors, it's going to converge to being something really close to an eigenvector. And then we can just use our uh, Rayleigh quotient to get the eigenvalue. But the, the whole point of this is that we can get the other eigenvalues with this method simply by choosing a good guess of that eigenvalue as the shift. We have to know what a good guess of uh, an eigenvalue is going to be for our shift, otherwise we're not going to get uh, those other eigenvalues. And so that's where Rayleigh iteration comes in. A Rayleigh iteration is just inverse iteration but we are going to use the Rayleigh quotient as the shift after an initial guess. So in inverse iteration, we're going to choose some shift, and that shift is going to stay the same shift all throughout uh, every single iteration. Whereas with the Rayleigh iteration algorithm, we're going to be changing that shift every single time by computing a new shift using that Rayleigh uh, quotient. And if when we use that Rayleigh quotient in conjunction with the shift, things are going to improve and be much faster. And so that's where uh, the whole idea of using uh, a shift with the QR algorithm comes into play to speed things up is through this Rayleigh uh, iteration algorithm. This Rayleigh iteration algorithm and computing a new shift each iteration is what speeds up our uh, inverse iteration algorithm, so we're not just using the same shift every single time. By introducing the shift, we get the different eigenvalues, but it's through this Rayleigh iteration that we see that we can get those other eigenvalues much, much faster. And so in reality, we're just going to use this Rayleigh iteration right here. And so uh, with this eig Rayleigh function, we are going to uh, pass in an our A matrix and then uh, some value for our initial guess for our shift. And then it's just doing everything that you saw before. Unfortunately, because uh, computing inverses is very tricky and definitely one of the uh, drawbacks of this method, um, we have to use the NumPy Linalge uh, inverse function here to uh, compute an inverse. But we're doing the same thing as we did before. This time we're going to work up to uh, precision on order of 10 to the minus 16. And uh, we're going to you know create that shift matrix. Then we're going to invert... Uh, a minus our shift, 
then we are going to uh, multiply that by our randomly generated x vector. We will uh, normalize that top part and then divide it. And then we'll compute uh, the Rayleigh quotient of the produced uh, x vector, compute the difference, reset that eigenvalue you know, for, for the use of computing the, the difference uh, with the next iteration, and then we'll reset that shift to be whatever that, that eigenvalue was. We'll bump our iterations, and we'll return the eigenvalue, uh, whatever that, that x vector will be, because that, that x vector is also getting reset every single time, so in theory that should converge to be an eigenvector as well, and it will also uh, give us the total number of iterations. Here in the code to uh, demonstrate that, we have the eigenvalues uh, from before and then the eigenvectors just as a reference. We're going to iterate through all of the eigenvalues with A because I'm uh, you know, really too lazy to uh, t take a stab at guessing what these eigenvalues are because, again, the, the, the whole point of the, another drawback of this, uh, whether it's the inverse or the, the Rayleigh iteration, is you have to be able to choose a good guess for what for what one of the eigenvalues is going to be, which isn't really efficient at all, because what if you have a bad guess? There, there are no guidelines for choosing a good guess, other than to choose something close to one of the eigenvalues. So our guess is just going to be um, the eigenvalue, uh, the eigenvalues from the uh, NumPy Linalge eig function minus 0 0.99, uh, and then we're just going to pass everything through, uh, and then we're going to uh, print everything out. And uh, one of the things that we have to throw in here is this NumPy Linalge Linalge error, because in some cases you might actually create a, a matrix uh, with this shift that's actually not invertible, and that's definitely another drawback of this method. And so this is what we get when we uh, spit everything out right here. Just to remind everybody, these are the uh, eigenvalues from before for the same randomly generated 3x3a three three matrix and the corresponding eigenvectors. Using the first guess from that first eigenvalue, you can see it only takes five iterations, and you can see it takes you know five, five, six iterations with each one of these, but you have to rerun this every single time uh, you know, to get each eigenpair, and that's just really inefficient. Uh, but nevertheless, it does produce all of the same eigenvalues as you might expect through the NumPy Linalge eig function. Uh, but those are, I guess in reality, five different methods for computing eigenvalues. I'll encourage you to explore all of the methods that we discussed, including matrix similarity, surety composition, and the Rayleigh quotient, with the references in the Jupyter Notebook linked at the GitHub link in the description. I'll encourage you to check out and, and rerun all the code for yourself because I think that's the best way that you're going to really understand how this works is just go through and, and show it a few different times. And yeah, folks, uh, I definitely went way more in the weeds with this video and spent way more time on it than I otherwise uh, really wanted to, but those are just some numerical methods for computing eigenvalues. Uh, eigenvalues and computing eigenvalues is certainly very useful all over the place where you're going to be using linear algebra. But I want to thank you all very much for watching. And I hope to see you again next time.